Okay, good afternoon. I'm Angie Murad. I'm a patient educator with the Stephen and Barbara Sloggy Cancer Education Program, and I'll be moderating this session. This is our five part of a six part series on survivorship, and this particular um, se session is on cancer related fatigue. We want people to know um, that we are recording this session so that individuals who are unable to join us live um, can watch it later. So I'm recording the session and allow us about three, three business days to have the recording edited and then put on Mayo Clinic Connect. Um, so, and that's typically found on our video library tab on Connect. And to let you know, May Mayo Clinic Connect is a digital platform where patients, family members and caregivers can connect to get evidence-based information and get access to information about classes and webinars that our Cancer Education Center provides. Um, you don't have to be a Mayo Clinic patient. Anyone can join um, Mayo Clinic Connect, our cancer education blog, and I will put it um, the link to our cancer education blog on Mayo Clinic Connect as soon as we get started with our webinar. So if you want to check that out and stay up to date on any information that we have available. Um, so if to find out more about classes or webinars, click on our classes and resources tab um, and you can find out more and register for other webinars and call in for any class information that you would like to know about. So I want people to know that we will take questions at the end of this session that are related to cancer related fatigue. Um, so please type them in the chat at the bottom of the, your Zoom screen. So just to let you know, Amy Kuth is another patient educator and she will be presenting. So I will turn it over and let Amy get started. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Angie. And as Angie mentioned, this is session five of our six part series. And we're going to be talking about cancer related fatigue today. Before we get started, I just have a disclaimer that the information in this webinar is not intended or implied to be a substitute for personal medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And please just always work with your physician or your qualified healthcare provider when making any adjustments to medications, supplements, or when making any major lifestyle changes. And because this webinar is part of our survivorship series, it's helpful to define what we actually mean by cancer survivor. The American Cancer Society uses the term cancer survivor to refer to anyone who has ever been diagnosed with cancer, no matter where they are in the course of their disease. And not everyone who has or who has had cancer uses or identifies with the word survivor, and that's okay. For some people, this term just doesn't feel right. They may feel more comfortable defining themselves as a person who has had cancer or a person living with cancer or perhaps another way. And I just encourage you to use whatever term feels right for you. All right, so these are the learning objectives for today's session. We are going to talk about what cancer related fatigue is actually define it. We're going to talk about what uh, common cancers of cancer-related fatigue are. We'll discuss and explore a variety of different strategies to manage cancer-related fatigue. Today, we're actually gonna talk about six different strategies. And then lastly, identify one doable next step to implement what you learn so that you are taking what you learned and actually putting it into action. Let's start talking about what is cancer-related fatigue. Fatigue is one of the most common side effects of cancer and its treatments. And cancer-related fatigue is defined as a persistent physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion, often not matching the activity level um, and often does not get better with rest. It's very different than normal fatigue that we might get or experience from a bad night's sleep or just from a really physically demanding day. Cancer-related fatigue often interferes with daily life and can cause a lot of frustration. For some patients, they even find it more upsetting than symptoms or side effects such as pain or nausea. Cancer-related fatigue could last for months or perhaps even years after finishing the treatment. Or after finishing treatment, it really just is different for everyone and depends on what your specific diagnosis is, the treatment that you had in your specific situation. 
If you have cancer-related fatigue, you might experience some of the following symptoms. You might have less energy for your usual activities, including things like basic self-care, showering, grooming, cooking, eating, feeding yourself. You might feel weak or even um, heavy in your legs and arms. You might feel unmotivated to do your usual activities or even struggle getting moving in the morning or throughout the day. You might have a hard time finishing tasks because you feel too tired, or you might feel tired for longer than usual after completing tasks. Um, you might find that sleeping just doesn't really help. And on top of that, potentially having some trouble concentrating or remembering things, we call that cognitive fatigue that can come along with uh, physical fatigue. And you might also feel a little bit more emotional than usual. Symptoms can range from mild to severe. And if you're experiencing any level of fatigue, I would highly encourage you to tell your healthcare team about what you're experiencing so that they can address the issue and hopefully help you to feel a little bit better. So let's talk about what causes cancer-related fatigue. Doctors don't actually know the exact cause. It's not usually caused by just one thing either. Typically, it's a combination of different factors. Fatigue can be caused by cancer treatments. Most people receiving cancer, cancer treatments such as chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery, or other types of treatments experience fatigue. Treatments can cause lower level of red blood cells. We call that anemia. Or they can cause hormone levels to be too high or too low, which can also contribute to fatigue. Side effects and symptoms can also contribute to fatigue. Side effects especially related to nutrition, so things like nausea, loss of appetite or dehydration can really contribute uh, to feeling fatigued and tired. If you have pain, you may feel or you might be less active, you might be eating less or sleeping less, all of which are things that can contribute to fatigue as well. Anxiety, depression, and stress uh, can cause fatigue. Anxiety and depression are the most common psychological reasons that fatigue occurs, and stress can actually worsen the feelings of fatigue. This would include stress that you might be experiencing from just worrying about the unknowns of having cancer, as well as the daily stress that might be related to your job, taking care of children, the bills that you have to pay, errands, housework, things like that can all contribute to stress. Certain medications can also contribute to fatigue. Pain relievers and anti-nausea meds can make you really sleepy. And steroids can actually have the opposite effect, making it hard for you to sleep. And lastly, cancer itself and other medical conditions such as heart, lung, kidney, or nerve problems can also contribute to fatigue. But the good news is that there are many ways that we can reduce or manage cancer-related fatigue, and that's what we're going to spend the most of our time talking about today. So today we're going to talk about six different strategies to manage cancer-related fatigue, including self-assessment, energy conservation, exercise, nutrition, sleep, and stress management. And all of these strategies are within your control. So we'll start talking about uh, the strategy of self-assessment. People experience cancer-related fatigue very differently. And one of the most important steps you can do to um, help with your fatigue is to do an assessment of your specific experience with fatigue. Keeping a diary to track and assess your fatigue will help you and it will help your care team figure out the best way to address and manage it. Noticing and writing down information about how you're feeling and when can help you find different patterns. So here are some good questions to ask yourself when you're keeping a diary. First, when did your fatigue start? So this might be in the context of when did it start during the course of your diagnosis? Did it start right away? Did it happen later on? Did you have it before you were diagnosed? Or also thinking about during the course of your day. So did you feel fatigued the moment you woke up or did it come on at a certain point during your day? And along with that, how has it changed? Is it different now compared to last month or compared to last week? Or does it change throughout the day at all? And how bad is it? Rating it on a scale of zero to 10 can be a really good way to assess the actual intensity of your fatigue. And 
how are you experiencing or what are you experiencing in your body, mind, and your emotions? This can really help us to identify what your specific symptoms are with fatigue, because again, we all experience fatigue a little bit differently. Another question to consider is what did you do today and when? When you reflect on this question, it may also be helpful to write down what you, what you ate and when you ate it, what medications you're taking, and also how well you're sleeping. And it can be helpful to reflect on what helps your fatigue as well as what makes your fatigue worse to identify some of those patterns. And lastly, how does your fatigue affect the things that you want to do? This can really help you and your healthcare team understand how much the fatigue is actually interfering with your everyday life. Identifying these patterns with your fatigue, such as when you have the most or the least amount of energy can make it easier to manage the fatigue and can make it easier to plan your day. It is recommended to keep a diary for at least a week. And this can be, um, it can also be helpful to note any changes from week to week or from month to month as well as you're doing this assessment or as you're keeping your diary. So because self-assessment involves paying attention to how we feel in the present moment, um, I wanted to do a little activity with you. This is something that we can practice even when we're feeling good. Noticing and naming specific sensations in our body, thoughts that are going through our mind or emotions that we're experiencing can help us to gather some really important information about our health and about our well-being. So I'm going to take you through a short activity that might be helpful to do when you're tracking or assessing your fatigue. So for this activity, I encourage you just to find a relaxing position as you are in your chair. <clears throat> and just sit comfortably. You can rest your eyes. You can close your eyes or just kind of gaze softly downwards and relax your muscles. And just take a moment first to just become aware of the fact that you uh, are breathing, that you have an inhale and that you have an exhale. And knowing that there's no right or wrong way to be breathing, so we're not trying to breathe a certain way, but just simply bringing awareness to our breath as it already is in this moment. Inhaling with the awareness that we're breathing in. And exhaling with the awareness that we're breathing out. And just bring awareness to your breath for a few more breaths in and out. And when you're ready, I encourage you to bring awareness to your body. So just kind of doing a quick mental scan from your head all the way down to your toes and noticing any physical sensations that you're experiencing right now. And as you notice these sensations, see if you can practice naming them. So you might label it with um, pain or warmth or weakness, maybe relaxed, whatever that station feels like for you, see if you can give it a label or a name. Taking about 10 more seconds here in the space. Good. And when you're ready, moving our awareness next into our mind. So noticing the state of our mind and noticing the thoughts that are coming through. And again, trying not to judge the thoughts at all. There's no right or wrong thoughts to be having. Just simply becoming aware of your thoughts and see if you can practice categorizing them as either a negative thought, a positive thought, or a neutral thought. So give us about 30 seconds to practice that.
Nice job. All right, next we're gonna bring our awareness to our emotions. Noticing how you are feeling in this moment on an emotional level and see if you can identify the most predominant emotion that you're experiencing right now. And once you have a grasp on what that emotion is, see if you can actually give it a name. What would you call it? Keeping the experience of that emotion in mind, bringing your attention to your body and noticing what does this specific emotion feel like in your body? Where do you notice it in your body? And then gently bringing your attention back to your immediate surroundings, maybe a little wiggling your fingers and toes, widening your eyes. And then I'd like to give you about 30 seconds, just a brief amount of time to, to reflect on what you noticed. What did you experience with that activity? So if you have a paper and a pen in front of you, I encourage you to write down what you noticed. And if you don't, that's okay. You can just ment mentally reflect on your experience. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that right now. And I'm gonna reflect right along with you. Just a few more seconds here. All right. So I encourage you to do this activity a few times throughout your day and write down what you notice in your diary. This can be a really helpful way to um, do the reflective exercise and to help figure out some more specific things to put in your diary as well. All right, next we're gonna talk about energy conservation as our second strategy. Think of your energy as the money that you need to get through a day. So maybe you used to have 10 coins in your energy bank and now you only have five, especially with feeling fatigued. So just like a normal bank account, deposits will get made throughout the day, withdrawals will get made throughout the day, or you know, taking money out of that account as we use energy up. And energy conservation is the way that you budget those coins so that you can get the most done without running out of money before you go to bed or without running out of energy before you go to bed. So a couple of tips to consider as uh, you think about your energy bank and energy conservation. It's important to pay attention to your energy bank account and you can use your diary to help you with this. So becoming aware of when you're the most energetic or when you have the most coins and when you're the most tired or when you have the fewest coins in your energy bank. And noticing what helps make your fatigue better or when you're making those deposits, you're spending uh, or adding more energy to the bank, and also what makes your fatigue worse. What are the types of things that, um, that you do that make you spend the money out of your account? And you can use this information to help you, oops, I jumped ahead, to help you plan your day um, for how to spend your day in terms of the types of activities that you do. So I encourage you to be active at the time of day when you feel the most alert and the most energetic. Plan your most important activities for this particular time. And then vice versa, if you feel most fatigued at a certain time of day, 
especially if you've established a pattern around that, try to plan your tasks around that. Do those tasks or activities before or after that period of time so that you can reserve that time for rest when you most need it. It's also important to pace yourself. <clears throat> so saving your energy by changing how you do things. For example, alternating sitting and standing can be helpful. For example, sitting on a stool while you cook or when you wash dishes. And just as a side note, the chair that you use is also important. So make sure that you're using a chair that gives you good support so that you're not wasting energy in just the act of sitting. And if you've got a load of something that you need to carry from one point to another, try to carry several smaller loads as opposed to carrying it all at once or one bigger heavy load that will help um, when you're bringing groceries in, for example. It can also be helpful to use devices that will um, can help you save energy. So this would include things like raised toilet seats, using a walker or a wheelchair, especially on those, those days where you might feel extreme fatigue. And then changing where you store things in your house can be helpful. So if there's something that you use a lot, put it someplace that's really convenient for you to get to so that you're not taking multiple trips back and forth, trying to get that item multiple times a day. And also it wastes a lot of energy reaching above you or above your head. So if there's something that you store high that you use a lot, see if you can store it a little bit lower to help save some of the energy that is involved with that as well. Remember that a slower pace is always better than rushing through activities and then alternating between periods of activity and rest can be helpful. For example, taking a short nap or a rest break in between two different activities that you're doing. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. All right, so the next tip is to prioritize the activities in your day. So I encourage you to do what you enjoy, but maybe just do less of it, especially if it's something that takes up a lot of energy. Focus on the tasks that make you feel happy or that help you feel like your normal self. You can choose older new interests that don't tire you out very easily. So for example, trying something like um, reading something brief or listening to music, those are types of things that don't require a lot of your energy. And then avoiding energy zappers can be really helpful. Those things you, that use up a lot of coins and maybe you've identified what some of those things are when you do your diary. For a lot of people, this can be taking hot showers, extreme temperatures, either hot or cold can be energy zappers. Um, we all have very individualized things that can zap our energy. Maybe there's a negative person that in our life, that if we hang around with them, we feel really drained. So identify what that is for you and see if you can avoid those things if possible. And then lastly, practicing the three Ds, drop, delegate, or defer the activities that are less important or less appealing to you. So choosing how you spend your energy try to let go of or drop the things that maybe just don't matter as much anymore. And think about ways that you can let other people help you, that you can delegate um, to other people. They might cook a meal or run errands or do the laundry. Uh, if it can be helpful maybe to come up with a very specific list as you think of things so that as people reach out for you to help, you have something specific to give them. So being as specific as possible, maybe it's I need somebody to make tacos for me tonight or arrange a play date for my kids or walk my dog or reschedule this particular appointment or maybe pick up my medications. A lot of time friends and family want to help, but they're just not sure what to do. So giving them something specific to do can be really helpful. You could also consider hiring somebody for assistance, things like cleaning the house doing lawn services or delivering groceries uh, as examples. And then for defer, one important question to ask yourself is, does this need to be done now? Does it need to be done today or can it wait? Can it wait until next week or next month or depending on what it is, maybe even next year? All right, so, so moving on to the third strategy, Exercise. Exercise is actually the most important thing that you can do to fight fatigue. 
Many studies with different types of patients over and over again have proven this to be the case. First and foremost, I encourage you to discuss with your healthcare provider what exercise might look like for you. They'll be the ones that will be able to tell you if there's any reason that you shouldn't exercise or if there are any modifications that you should make to make sure that you're exercising safely. I recommend exercising when your energy level is high. So this is the time that you're most likely to do the exercise and when you're most likely to be successful with it. It's also important to include different types of exercise in your exercise routine. Some different types of exercise would be aerobic. Aerobic is things like walking, cycling, swimming, dancing, really anything that gets your heart rate elevated for a prolonged period of time. Strength training is another type of exercise. The, that would include things like hand weights, working with weight machines. You can use elastic bands to do weight training, and you can also use your body weight uh, without using any equipment at all as a way to do strength training as well. Flexibility is another type of exercise that's important to include. This can range from uh, just simple stretching exercises to a yoga practice. And then balance is another type of exercise that would be good to include. Tai Chi and yoga are good exercises that help with balance, or even just simple things like shifting your weight side to side or forward and back, or standing on one foot for an amount of time can help increase your balance. I would recommend starting slow and gradually increasing. This is gonna help make sure that you're successful with the exercise. It also helps to make sure that you're not injuring yourself or increasing too quickly. I would encourage you to start with a small doable goal, whatever that means for you. Maybe it's just a couple of minutes to start with, five minutes or 10 minutes, depending on where your current level is at. And um, trying to do this at a moderate intensity. A moderate intensity means that it, you should feel like the exercise is challenging, but that you are still able to talk, that you can still carry on a conversation. Maybe not belt out a song or give out a speech, but that you're still able to talk as you're exercising. And just, gradually adding a couple more minutes as it gets easy. Maybe it's every couple of weeks or whatever that means for you, uh, depending on how the exercise is going for you. And the general recommendation is to work up to 30 minutes five or more times per week. And it's okay to combine shorter sessions as well to add up to that 30 minutes. So five minutes here, 10 minutes there, that all counts towards that 30 minutes. I encourage you to find ways to enjoy moving to keep yourself motivated. Probably the most important way you can do this is to choose an activity that you're going to enjoy. So if you're like me and you don't like swimming, then maybe don't do swimming as your exercise routine. Maybe you choose something like walking or cycling or something else that you really enjoy. You could also try exercising with a pet or with a friend, maybe listening to music or watching TV as you exercise to help the time go by a little bit faster. It can also be rewarding to track your progress on paper or in an online app. And other ways to reward yourself as well can be helpful um, just with something positive that you know you're going to enjoy. So buying something that you want or maybe um, scheduling a massage, for example. And if you're the type of person that doesn't like to do the same thing over and over again, adding variety in the types of exercises that you do can be helpful too. Very important to listen to your body. I can't stress this enough. You shouldn't not experience any increase in pain with your exercise program. And if this does happen, or if something just doesn't feel right when you're exercising, we would want you to stop and make sure that you talk with your healthcare provider before continuing. And overall, just avoiding inactivity. So sometimes you just won't feel like exercising and know that that is okay. Simply just do what you can on that day. It might be just standing up, from the couch and walking into the kitchen and seeing how that goes for you. You can try informally adding movement into your daily routine, parking further away, um, or just moving your body when you're sitting in place. All of those little things really add up throughout the day and can count. So for more information on benefits and, the guide and guidelines for physical activity for cancer patients, I would encourage that you check out our recorded webinar from session number four of our series, which is all about physical activity. And you can find this video on our cancer education page on Mayo Clinic Connect.
Moving on to, actually, I have, uh, I want to do another activity with you to help kind of break up our content today. Um, I'm going to lead you through some just seated gentle movement. And this is an example of a simple way that you can add movement into our into your day without even getting up out of your chair. So listen to your body and adjust the movement. If it um, doesn't feel good for you, adjust it so that it does feel good for you. And if you just don't feel comfortable following along, that's okay too, you can just watch. So I'll just take, it'll just be a couple of minutes to lead you through some gentle activity just as you are sitting in your chair right now. I'm gonna pull back just a little bit so you can see me a little bit better. So the first thing we're gonna do is an exercise that I call pulling rope. <laughs> so you're going to take an inhale and just straighten your arms out in front of you. And then pretend like you've got two big ropes in front of you and you're grabbing onto those ropes and you're gonna pull those ropes back towards you. Then inhale, straightening your arms out, reaching out in front. And then exhale, grab those ropes and pull them in. And as you do this, just kind of think about squeezing your belly muscles. Inhale, reach. Exhale, pull. As you pull back, you can think about maybe squeezing, gently squeezing your shoulder blades together to activate those muscles. Good. One more time, reaching out. Exhale, pulling in. And we'll move into another exercise. I call this circulating. So you're just gonna kind of move your hands in a circle in front of you. You might want to imagine that you've got a big round drum in front of you and you're just kind of tracing the edge of the drum with your fingertips. And adjusting the movement in any way that feels good for you. When you're ready, switching directions, circling the other way. Continuing to breathe. Good. And relax. Uh, the next exercise we're going to do is rowing. So you're going to pretend like we're out on a lake or a body of water. We're sitting in a canoe and we're going to row our boat. So you've, you're holding on to your paddle. You're going to gently twist to one side and row that paddle in the water. Twist to the other side and row in the other direction and just kind of twist side to side, continuing to breathe as you do that. Inhale as you're coming in and then exhale as you're doing the rowing. If it doesn't feel good to twist, you can just kind of do that just right in place, gently without twisting. And again, engaging or tightening those belly muscles. Good. and relax your arms. And then lastly, just to incorporate the lower body a little bit, we're gonna pretend like we're in a parade and we're in a marching band. Uh, so bring your hands out in front of you. You probably can't see my lower half right now, but you're just gonna gently lift one leg at a time, alternating legs, just lifting your knee up just a couple of inches off of your chair. And if that doesn't feel right for you, you can just keep your feet on the floor and maybe just raise your heels up and down. And just a couple more times. Good, and relax. So hopefully you felt your blood starting to circulate, maybe a little burst of energy as you did that gentle activity in place. And again, just a very simple example of how you can incorporate move, uh, movement into your day. And we did that without even getting up. All right, so next we're gonna talk about nutrition. Cancer-related fatigue is often made worse if you aren't eating enough or if you're not eating the right kinds of foods. Maintaining good nutrition can really help you feel better and help you have more overall energy. And everyone's nutritional needs can be different. So it's important that if your care team has given you any specific dietary guidance that you do follow that. Today, I just wanna give you some very general recommendations. The first is to eat foods that are plant-based. This would include things like fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, beans, or legumes. And you can also include some lean protein in this as well. Protein rebuilds and repairs our damaged body tissue. So it's important to include that in our diet. Examples of plant-based protein would be nuts or seeds, beans, Tofu and quinoa is also an example. Um, it's, it's a grain that's also a source of protein. 
And then lean sources of animal-based protein would be fish, turkey, chicken. Really important thing is just to try to avoid the red meats. We recommend going easy on the salt, the fat, and the sugar, as well as limiting processing foods because, or limiting processed foods, because both of these, these things can actually increase your fatigue, make you feel a little bit more lethargic. Um, <clears throat> and when you think about limiting processed foods, it's important to think about how many times it has actually changed from its original form. So an apple, for example, thinking about how that grows in nature on a tree and what it looks like compared to when it arrives on your plate, it's very similar. And a Cheeto, on the other hand, is very different. So I've still not found a Cheeto field out in nature. So that is something that we know must have been processed probably several times over before it actually got uh, to our plate. So thinking about how close does it look to uh, its original form. It's also important to add variety and color into our diet. This will help make sure that you get a balance of different nutrients that work together to promote healing. And <clears throat> you hear people talk about eating the rainbow. So different colors will actually give you different kinds of nutrients. And this is another way to help just prevent boredom and making eating more enjoy enjoyable as well. It's also important to stay hydrated. Eight cups of eight cups of fluid a day will prevent dehydration. And water, of course, is a great source of fluid, but other types of fluids that would count would be juice, milk or milkshakes. Um, broth would be another example that would be a good source of fluid to stay hydrated. Things that wouldn't count would be drinks that have caffeine in it because caffeine can actually be dehydrating. And then if you're experiencing symptoms like vomiting or diarrhea, then it would be important to get some extra fluids to help counteract that. And consider seeing a dietitian, especially if you're having side effects that are interfering with your ability or your desire to eat, or if you just want a more specific nutrition plan. For more information and benefits and, um, and guidelines on nutrition for cancer patients, I encourage you to watch our webinar from session three of this series. And that was our tools for wellness on healthy weight and eating habits. And you can find this video in the same spot on our cancer education page on Mayo Clinic Connect. Next, we're gonna talk about sleep. Sleep problems are very common for people with cancer, both during and after treatment. Sleeping too much or sleeping too little can contribute to your fatigue. Too much sleep actually makes you weaker, can worsen symptoms of depression, and too little sleep can make you even more tired, emotionally stressed even before the day begins, and it can be hard on your immune system as well. So the key is really finding that sweet spot for you and focusing on getting a good night's sleep to help restore your energy. To help you sleep, it is important to develop good sleep habits. So today I just wanna talk through some tips or recommendations for good sleep. The first is to go to bed and get up at the same time every day. So this means even on the weekends or on your days off and no matter how you slept that night. So even if it was a particularly bad night of sleep, the recommendation is to still keep that consistent routine trying to get at least seven to eight hours of good sleep. Research shows that people who follow a consistent sleep pattern tend to sleep better. It's also important to create a comfortable sleeping environment. A lot of things play into this. So keeping your bedroom dark, cool and quiet can make a big difference. If noise is an issue for you, using a noise machine might be helpful to cover up the noise or even using a fan. If you do use a fan, just make sure that you point it away from you so that doesn't dis uh, distract you as well. It's recommended to use your bedroom for sleep or intimacy only. So your body doesn't associate your bedroom with other activities that you would do while you're awake. If you can try to avoid letting pets sleep with you in your bedroom, I know this is one that I really struggle with because I have a little dog that likes to sleep with me on my bed. So if you do have them sleep with you or they're in your bedroom and they're making noise and keeping you up, putting in earplugs can really be beneficial to help with that. 
and also avoiding visual triggers that increase stress. This could be just clutter in your bedroom. It could be materials related to stressful issues that you're dealing with, for example, financial bills, trying to eliminate those things in your bedroom. And then just simple things like having clean linens, comfortable clothes that you're sleeping in, a soothing wall color can all go a long ways in helping to create a really relaxable, relaxing space. We wouldn't deter you from taking naps, but if you do take naps, we would recommend that you limit your naps to 30 minutes and that they're at least six to eight hours before bedtime to prevent disrupting your normal sleep cycle. And it's also important to set a bedtime routine. Oftentimes people will turn down the lights as part of this routine. Doing things that relax you can be helpful in this time, listening to music, stretching, deep breathing, snug snuggling with a pet or maybe reading a book. And developing a bedtime ritual with things that give you a sense of security and comfort. So for me, I know that um, I check the lights, I lock all the doors, I have a personal grooming routine that I do that just helps my body recognize that I'm gearing up and getting ready to go to bed. It can also be helpful to keep a notepad and pen by your bed if you have any last minute thoughts that you uh, want to jot down so that you're not distracted by those thoughts when you go to bed. Avoiding stimulants before bedtime. A couple of things to consider here. So try not to drink anything that has caffeine in it after midday or afternoon. And then for alcohol, try not to drink anything with alcohol close to bedtime. At first, it might seem like it's actually helping because it can make you sleepy, but research shows that it actually contributes to poor quality of sleep and can make people wake up throughout the night. Doing regular exercise will help you sleep better, but try not to do it four to six hours before bedtime so that your body isn't revved up from the exercising. Avoid eating a heavy meal two to three hours before bedtime. A light snack is okay. And if you tend to wake up a lot during the night to go to the bathroom, then you would probably wanna consider avoiding drinking fluids for the about three hours before bedtime to help with that and generally avoiding using electronics. TV, computer, cell phone in that one hour before bedtime can be helpful too. And having a plan if you can't fall asleep is important too. If you wake up and you are comfortable in bed, go ahead and stay in bed. Try to think about relaxing images or do muscle relaxation or anything else that maybe relaxes you. If you find that you're awake for 15 minutes or longer, uh, especially if you're not comfortable, then the recommendation would be to get out of bed and go to another quiet space in your home. Try not to stay in your bedroom and do a quiet or even a, a boring activity that will help make you sleepy. Don't go, uh, don't watch the TV or go on the computer because that could actually contribute to the problem. And then just go back to bed only when you start to feel sleepy, even if it seems like it's taking a long time to get to that point. And overall, just remembering that sleep, especially during the daytime, typically does not help your cancer-related fatigue. So if you're consistently having problems sleeping, I would highly encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider just to make sure there isn't anything else that needs to be addressed there. All right, the last strategy we're gonna talk about today is stress management. When you are tired, it is a lot harder to handle the stress of everyday life. And stress can also cause you to unintentionally do things that will make your fatigue worse, like tensing up your muscles, gritting your teeth or stiffening your shoulders. All of those things require a lot of energy and can waste a lot of energy. So strategies to help you manage stress and relax have been shown to help relieve cancer-related fatigue. Today, I just wanna offer some suggestions for you. The first one is to learn what triggers your stress and how you react. I like to call this your stress language because everybody reacts a little bit differently and everybody has different sources of stress in their life. So thinking about what elements of daily life most impact your individual stress level. Naturally, if you have a cancer diagnosis, that is gonna be on that list. 
thinking about beyond that, what else might be contributing to your stress? Is there a relationship in your life that's particularly challenging for you right now? Are finances stressing you out? Do you have work-related stress? Or maybe just thinking about your to-do list is stressful enough. Everyone responds differently. So thinking about how do you know that you're stressed? What do you notice physically and mentally, emotionally or behaviorally? So for example, when I get stressed out, I typically will clench my jaw. I have digestion issues. I have trouble sleeping and I can get really impatient. So when I start to notice those things, I become aware of the fact that I must be really stressed out about something. Sometimes your body will actually tell you that you're stressed before your mind realizes that you're stressed. So paying attention to how you know that you're stressed. And once you identify your stress language, it makes it a lot easier to recognize, manage, and take control of your stress. And while you might not be able to control some of the stressors that you have in your life, you can often control your response to them. Thinking about how you can change or reduce your stressors. Before we had talked about practicing the three Ds, that fits in really well right here, drop, delegate, and defer. What can you drop or say no to that isn't important right now? Maybe there's a committee that you have been on that just isn't really a high priority for, for you right now. Is that something you can just drop from your list of responsibilities? What can you have other people do for you to help? How can you delegate? And then also what can be done a different day or a different month that you can just delay to a different time? I also encourage you to try relaxation techniques and integrative therapies. Examples of relaxation techniques would be things like relaxed breathing or deep breathing, guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, which is just a, symptom, a systematic way of relaxing your muscles. Meditation and mindfulness practices would fit in here as well. Examples of integrative therapies would be aromatherapy, Reiki, which is a form of stress reduction um, that where a practitioner can just kind of help balance your body. Music therapy, massage, tai chi, qigong, yoga, all of those things are examples of integrative therapies. Some of these things you might be able to explore on your own if you're comfortable, or you can also ask your healthcare provider for a referral to a professional who actually specializes in these methods to take you through the process or to um, do those things on you or for you. It's important to focus on things that you can control. Practicing healthy habits is one of those things to take care of yourself. Everything that we've talking about, been talking about already today, nutrition, exercise, sleep, et cetera, those are all things that we have control over. Also doing things that bring you joy and that energize your spirit. This is different for everybody. It might be spending time out in nature, spending time with the people that you love, if you are a person of faith, prayer might be on that list for you. Again, everybody is different. So just thinking about what is it that brings you joy? What is it that gives you energy? And trying to do more of those things in a way that seems feasible for you uh, in your day. Doing simple activities that divert your attention away from the fatigue can also be helpful. Activities like knitting, reading, listening to music, those things require very little physical energy, but they do require your attention. So they can be good distractors. And then just surrounding yourself with positive supportive people can go a long ways and as well. Changing your thoughts and attitudes. One way that you can do this is to adjust your expectations. So you might not be able to do as much right now and know that that is okay. If you have a list of 10 things that you want to accomplish in a day, maybe just pick two or three of those items as your goal for the day. A sense of accomplishment can increase your confidence level and go a long ways in reducing your stress. Practicing positive self-talk can be really helpful. I usually tell people just to follow one simple rule, and that is don't say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to a friend. So as much as possible, try to treat yourself as a friend. And 
as you do notice negative thoughts as inevitably they will come through, just try to gently reframe those thoughts in a positive way. Overall, just keeping a healthy perspective, trying to focus on what is going right versus what is going wrong, even if it seems like it's small. Know that what you pay attention to will grow stronger. So if you are focusing on the things that frustrate you, that sense of frustration is just going to get more intense and get stronger and stronger. Versus if you're focusing on gratitude, for example, that sense of gratitude is actually going to get stronger and stronger the more you practice it. Also, um, give yourself permission to laugh and be open to humor. Laughter is something that we know it makes us feel better. And just trying to live in the present moment, research shows that this is when we're the most happy. Lastly, I recommend seeking support. This can be really important in stress reduction. Family and friends can support us. So really helping them understand your experience with fatigue and how they can best support you. One thing to ask yourself, because everybody is different in what support means for them, what does support mean for you? What do you want that to look like? And how will your family and friends know that they're supporting you? What kind of feedback could you give them to let them know that they're, they're doing what is helpful for you? Support groups can be helpful too. Other people with cancer can really understand and relate to what you're going through. We do have support groups that are available on Mail Clinic Connect. Um, so I encourage you to check that out under the events page. And talking with a counselor, a social worker, or a therapist, if you're experiencing some difficult emotions, they can really help you work through some of those emotions that you're experiencing as well. All right, so changing your thoughts and attitudes, understandably, is not easy. It takes a lot of practice. You can think of your brain as a muscle that you need to train. If you want to train your arm to get stronger, you wouldn't expect it to get stronger if you didn't do exercise it. So our brain really is no different. We're going to take some time to practice some gratitude, and I am going to time us for 30 seconds. And your challenge during that 30 seconds is to try to think of as many things as you can that you are grateful for, no matter how big or how small they might seem. Try not to think about it too hard, just really whatever comes to mind, there's no right or wrong with this exercise. You can write your list down on a piece of paper, you can say it out loud, or you could just say it silently in your head. All right, so I'm gonna give us 30 seconds to do this. I've got my timer out. And I'm going to do it along with you. Ready, set, go. and time. All right. So just take a moment to notice how you feel right now after practicing 30 seconds of gratitude and think about what you noticed in that activity as well. Some common responses that I get when I do this exercise with people is that often people find it hard to get started with their gratitude list. But once they get a few things jotted down, maybe they just start with a couple of real small things, like I am grateful for the sun or warmth, for example, not that that's small, but um, it, it often gets easier and easier for people. So imagine how easy it would get if you kept practicing. People often say too that this helps them to feel better. Even just after 30 seconds of practicing gratitude, they feel lighter, happier, a little bit less stressed. So this is just one example of something that we can do to train our brain. And I really encourage you to explore different strategies and see what works for you. Okay, so we talked about a lot today and I will be sharing some additional resources on the Mayo Clinic Connect Cancer Education blog with the video recording of this webinar. 
I hope that there was something that you all were able to take away from today's session that you felt was valuable for you. So we're just gonna take a moment to reflect on what you learned and to actually identify one next step that you can take as part of an action plan. So I have a couple of questions for you to reflect on, and I encourage you again to either write it down or just reflect mentally, but I'm actually gonna give you about 30 seconds or so to reflect on these so you have some time right here and now um, after each one of these questions. So the first question is, what are one or two things that we talked about today that you felt really resonated with you? I'll give you 30 seconds to reflect on that. And then keeping those one or two things in mind for this next question, what is one next step that you can take to actually apply what you learned and turn it into action? So I encourage you to actually identify or pick a goal that feels doable for you, something that you have a really high level of confidence that you can actually accomplish. And try to be specific about what you will do and when you'll do it. So an example might be, when my energy level is high tomorrow, I will try going for a five to 10 minute walk outside. Or it might be something as simple as, this weekend I will explore the additional resources that Amy posts with this video on Mayo Clinic Connect. So I will give you about 30 seconds to reflect on this question and get something identified. Okay, so we'll leave it there. I'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, I realize I didn't leave a lot of time for questions. We do have a couple of minutes left though, if there are any questions. Thank you, Amy. Perfect, great presentation. Um, so we just have a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, I didn't see any in the chat, so we probably can answer these with the next few minutes. So um, one person had mm -hmm. asked the question that they've been coping with cancer-related fatigue for 12 years since radiation treatment for prostate cancer. Um, really, they can cope, but how can they get rid of it and wondering if it will ever end? That is a great question. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Really, the so the duration of cancer-related fatigue can vary, and everyone is different. Um, without knowing your specific situation, I wouldn't be able to give you a direct answer in terms of when you're going to be able to get rid of it or how long it's going to last. But I would really encourage you to um, to reach out to your care team and just let them know that this is something that you've been struggling with for a long time if you haven't already. Um, but it can it can be normal to still feel that fatigue beyond the period of your active cancer treatment. Um, some, some people do feel that fatigue for even years afterwards, especially with certain time, types of treatments. Um, so again, really just encourage that open communication with your care team um, and Hopefully, if your symptoms continue to persist, or if it's, you know, going to be just something that you manage during your life, that hopefully some of these strategies will help um, work for you. Angie, is there anything that you would add to that at all? Sorry, I realized that was muted. <laughs> um, so the only thing, I mean, I took away 
all of what you spoke about. So just reiterating all of those things that you spoke about, like horm, you know, checking in, are you still taking hormones? Um, are you possibly anemic? Um, and that emotional piece, are there, is there stress or even um, depression, anxiety, all of those things, which can lead to um, feeling fatigued. So, and it's been so long since, um, since the treatment, I wonder if just even reaching out to primary care physician, if that's where you're getting most of your treatment right now, if you're not seeing your oncologist or oncology care team. So, yeah, that's a good point. And I think that just kind of being able to understand what is the cause of that chronic fatigue, you know, is it mm -hmm. like Angie said, is it due to a medication maybe mm -hmm. that you're still on or taking as a, a long-term thing, or is it stress-related? Your care team or your primary healthcare provider will really be able to do a better assessment on figuring out what might be at the root of that to better be able to help you. And then I'll just have one question. Um, I do see another one in the chat and I can even put post that on the answer to that on connect because I just want to be respectful of people's time too. But um, the next question is just recommendation on supplements that might help, for example, ginseng. So I don't know if you feel comfortable with that or if you want me to answer that. I open it up to you, Amy. Oops. Um, sure. So Sometimes medication and supplements can help, um, especially if there is an underlying cause of fatigue that's something that the care team can test for. So if there's a hormonal imbalance or anemia, um, there are things that can be prescribed that can help with that. You mentioned ginseng, um, that's a plant root a plant root that there have been many studies on that and that could potentially help as well. Um, if that's something that you're considering, I would highly recommend that you reach out to your care team first or your primary physician and just make sure that that is something that is safe for you to take, that you have the proper guidelines um, specifically on how to take that as well. But that is something that um, studies have shown could potentially help. Angie, anything else that you would add? No, though, I, I totally agree because yes, it can interact with other medications and not even specific to cancer treatment mm -hmm. medications. So yeah, just always double checking because sometimes there might be added ingredients and in supplements. Um, so it's really good to just make sure that doesn't interact with anything. So perfect. Um, do we want to do one more or you think we're all set? <laughs> Oh, uh, we can, we can do one more if people okay. need There's to. There's just go one off, more. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, we'll just go for it. Um, so the last question is just like, why is it important to avoid red meat? We, you had kind of mentioned a little bit more with like processed meats or processed foods. Um, not, and I, I'm trying to remember if it was specifically red meat. But someone yeah, had just said, yeah, I did so. mention limiting processed foods. Um, I think the red meat came into play when I was referring to lean protein sources and um, recommending to avoid the red meats. Angie, I think as a dietitian, you might be able to speak to this a little bit better. Um, yeah, and we do. And I thank you for all, always referring back to those other webinars that we did. So the, the last one we did on the two before this last one, um, there's one on nutrition. So, but just to speak specifically to red meat, there's several um, factors with that. Um, and they're not sure exactly which one is, is the root cause, but there's several factors that might be um, causing that. So avoiding red meat um, is just because of compounds that are formed when you grill meats. Um, so they can cause compounds that um, are considered carcinogen. So when the fat from the, the meats um, chars red meat, it forms certain compounds. So um, that might be carcinogenous. Car carcinogenic, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so that would be one reason. The other with red meat specifically is that it has heme in it, which gives it the red color, but that even is in some other meats. So they don't really know why specifically it is red meat. Another thing too, um, is that it could be in, um, also causing inflammation in the body and also changing 
the flora or gut bacteria. Um, that's another thing that they're thinking too. Um, and that, so it's more with red meat specifically like with colorectal cancer, um, increasing that risk. But it's really not saying that you can't ever eat it. It's just decreasing the amount. So um, really to, if you think about a deck of cards is like three ounces, keeping your total weekly amount to like 16 to 18 ounces for the whole week. So it's really not that low. It's pretty generous in the amount, but it's just thinking about more plant type proteins like beans or lentils um, and like chicken, fish. So getting protein from other sources. So that's kind of what relates back to red meat. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Yeah, no problem. Um, so just want to let people know that our um, next webinar will be our last one on our survivorship series is on um, December 7th, um, which is the first Wednesday of the month, also at one o'clock. Um, and then also wanted people to know too um, th that we will be, as the session closes out, you will receive an email to um, to fill out a quick survey. It's just to get information on what other topics you might be interested in um, on webinar topics. And then also knowing how we can do a better job with our webinars. We're always looking for um, feedback. So we appreciate your time this afternoon and hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Bye-bye.